Bible study, and I think that's great. It's all steam energy. It, it, it might be all letting off steam energy, but, but it's good. I mean, there, there's an energy. We're going to have a rowdy class tonight. This should be a lot of fun. All right, well, I'm glad that everyone came. So are we. You know, Russ went through right at the beginning of this series and kick stuff off. How many of you were here the, the, the first week when Russ uh, got everything going? I think probably, yeah, most of you. Uh, do you guys remember, like, Russ got up here and he was like, listen, this is gonna be a class about prayer. And Russ says, and I know I don't pray enough. <laughs> now, I don't know if you're like me, but how many of the rest of you were like, bull? I mean, this guy, come on. If anyone is going to pray enough, it's gonna be Russ, right? He's gotta be good at it. And yet, at the same time, I kind of feel the same way. I'm like, you know, we're all going to rotate through. We're all going to teach some stuff. And I'm like, yeah, teaching on, on prayer, like, I, I know what it is. I, I can do it. But uh, better pray about it. <laughs> yeah, any time that you're going to teach a class on something, it really makes you kind of reflect back at, at how you do it something. And I'm like, I don't really know if I should be standing up here. But at the same time, how many of you actually feel like that? How many people feel like you don't pray enough? Oh, absolutely. Pretty much everyone here. Well, why not? Randy, you rose your hand. Why not? Why don't you pray enough? Well, you know, I, I'm praying at times when I don't realize I'm praying. And, uh, you know, the scripture tells us to pray constantly. And I don't realize, but I, I do pray more than I realize I do. But I do have to get a little bit of sleep. I have some responsibilities. I have to work. But no, I mean, it's just something we need. Every one of us need to do more of. It's just that simple. I don't, I don't time it, but I, I do pray more than I realize I do. And uh, but it's still not enough. Hey Jeff, I think it's you know, the, to what Randy's saying there. I think it's more. Oh, I thought that was just to get my attention, but go ahead. You know, it's. I think it's less about how often we pray, and it's about the quality of prayer. You know, because I think probably I pray more than I think, but is it always quality, and, or is it just something quick? You know, throw it up real quick and, and go about my business. So I think. That's where I, I would you know, like, like focus on that. Okay, I thought I saw somebody else's hands. I got you, some back in the corner. I thought there was somebody over here, but we'll get back. Okay, go ahead, Judy. You asked why we don't, because we stay too involved with the world. Okay. We are so involved with the world and trying to run our lives every minute. We, we get carried away. We get carried away, and that's why as we've talked, and there's been a lot of lessons on praying first thing in the morning, is so huge because then the day starts and shoom, it, it's it's unbelievable how fast a day goes, how fast a week goes since we were here last week. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, Dorothy. Uh, I start to pray after about every morning. I have my coffee and I pray. That I'll, halfway through, I'm, I'm, my mind's already thinking of something else, mm -hmm. Very and it's like that all the time. And I'm just, I'm just frustrated. Yeah, it's, it, it's kind of like that uh, Disney movie Up, right, where the dog's like, squirrel. Yeah. That happens to me all the time, too. All the time. Yes. So I, pay a, I only pray at night, but sometimes I do talk to God throughout the day. What's the difference between praying and talking to God? Well, praying, I mean, praying is talking to God, essentially. Yeah. It's the same thing? Yeah, yeah that's, that's exactly what I it mean, is. I mean, I only pray at night and ask God to forgive me of all my sins, but I do talk to him throughout the day sometimes. Yeah, and that's great. Okay. Oh, I didn't know. So, mm -hmm. so Pam, did you have your hand up? Well, well, possibly we're doing God's work during the day, too. You know, whatever we're doing. We might not be praying to him, but distractions of the world, yes, and also doing his work, doing different things. That You're so busy doing God's work that that's why you don't pray enough. Good answer. Good answer. <laughs> Well, Tom. We like to be independent. We like to be self-sufficient. We like to think that we can do things, but uh, we, if we stop to think, God can help us if we ask, make the right decisions. 
to always do things just a little bit better. You don't have to, you don't have to pray for something vast, but no matter what it is you're doing, you should be, we, should, we should try, I try, so, try, to, try to be more involved with God as I do. So you don't pray enough because you don't need God. Got it. <laughs> Who else? That's not what I heard. <laughs> That's what I heard. I may have gotten that wrong. Better teachers trying to teach. <laughs> Go ahead. That's good. A- anyone else? Why, why don't you pray enough, Gina? Oh, I think just having a relationship with God. When you talk to Uncle John and Colonel Matt, you're just talking to God, not the, you know, the relationship with God. You're just saying, hi, God, I've got prayers. You know, get with me. Or, you know, or, you know I'm, I'm leaving everything in your hands today. I'm landing from your feet. I mean, you can talk to him constantly. And I, that's what I do throughout my whole day. So it's just like God is right here with me. It's that relationship that you have with God. Okay. Christy? I think sometimes for, for me, uh, well, there's a couple. One, when I say so, I fall asleep. Two, uh, I always want to give God, God the, like, the reverence that he deserves. and uh, So, like, I don't want anything going on. I want it to be completely quiet. I want to be on my knees. I want to be bowed down. I want to be, and then I never have time for that. So I'm like, I'll just get it in the car, you know. So you don't pray enough because so you're doing it wrong? Is that what you're... Um, no, like, I, I don't make time. I don't make the time. You don't make the time. Okay. Anyone else? Tyler. Uh, yeah, mine is a little more... Uh, it's pretty simple. It's pride and arrogance. That's that's the reason I don't pray enough. I know it's a shocker. <laughs> <laughs> we don't agree, Tyler. You know, we'd probably all have that answer if we were honest about it. Yes? We're too focused on ourselves. Too focused on ourselves. Yep. And... What everybody else is doing around us. <laughs> All right, do you focus on what people do around us, John? I think my issue is the word tells us to pray continually, but sometimes I'm like, okay, if I'm praying, how do I focus on doing this while praying while doing this, like simultaneously? Like, how do you, I don't, you know, if I'm driving, do I, you know what I mean? Sometimes I'm like, but then again, if I'm going to say, hey, just pray. It doesn't really distract me, so I need to not worry about that. Sometimes I worry about that. I think that as if almost mentally prayer is getting in the way of what I'm like cognitively trying to accomplish. And it just, it's added confusion you don't need. Like uh, earlier I was looking for uh, a vehicle for work in the back parking lot at this dealership. And I, I, something told me God doesn't want me to go on a wild goose chase looking for this. So I just said, hey, God, where is this thing? Because the key tag, the guy, the guy that sent me out, the the manager said that it didn't have uh, the color on the key tag, uh, didn't match the car. We don't know what color it is. You're gonna have to go to every uh, Buick Encore GX that's a 2020 and check the last six digits of the VIN. You just gotta press the red button. And, and I was like, and he said he said it might have something to do with the battery or something might not be able to do the thing. Oh, okay. You know, because he told me about that the other day, and I was like, oh wow, so. I just like, well, how do I do this? So I said, God, you know, can you show me where this is, you know? And I think it was a matter also of why I might not pray is I might get discouraged because of my own lack of uh, a trust in God or faith, not to ah, beat myself lack of up, trust. but I was like, hey, you know what? I'm not finding this. I asked you and you're not showing me. And I just gave up and just went up and down every aisle and walked myself and it was kind of warm. <laughs> and, and I was like, dude, you could have just, maybe right. a little more trust. So Hold I, on, Dave Rose's hand this time. An issue also. <laughs> I did the clip last time, like the flag, but, you know, and then that's where John, you know, and this is something that you can get to too. I know Russ talked about this before where, you know, be anxious about everything or you be anxious about nothing, don't pray about everything, right? And it's something, a lot of times what we read in scripture, it's hyperbole, right? And that's the word that he always uses, hyperbole, right? Uh, and so, you, you know, you can't pray at all times and about every single thing, you know what I mean? Otherwise, it's, you have to understand sometimes where it's literal and figurative. But. All right, yes. And I feel sometimes... Sometimes we're afraid to pray, especially in front of other people, because, well, we, we might be afraid some people might, like, look at us weird or make fun of us, but who cares? That's right. Ah, it's who peer cares? pressure, man. <laughs> it's you, absolutely. Who cares? You're worshiping the Lord. I want to Our every day for breathing, our everything. If absolutely. it wasn't for the Lord, none of us would be here. None of us would be born, none of us would be alive. Okay, I saw Barb first. Um, sometimes I feel unworthy to ask for the things that I want to ask for. So I, you feel unworthy like, to ask for what you want to ask for. 
Very good. Dorothy, did you have your hand up again? I, I think that's basically the same thing. Same I, idea? Yes. Even on communion day, I think, am I worthy of this? Am I worthy of this communion? You know? <coughs> Awesome. I knew we were going to have a rowdy bunch. I, I could probably do this the entire hour and not even have to cover anything. <laughs> All right. We've already mentioned it, but somebody read real quick for me. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 through 18. Half of us have already quoted it in our comments, so we should be pretty familiar with this one. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 16 through 18. Who wants to read that? I'll read it, Jim. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophetic utterances, but examine everything carefully, hold fast to that which is good. Okay, thank you. So, pray unceasingly, or pray constantly. And we sort of had some of that in some of the discussion, like, well, how do you even do that, or, or can I even do that? But it, it, it's, it's a command. It's something that we're supposed to be doing. So somebody uh, find John chapter 14 and read verses 14 through 18. Go ahead, Jim. And we have to be so careful about bringing in worthy, whether we're worthy or not, because we'll never, ever, ever be worthy. Yeah. We're not worthy of our salvation. We're not worthy of God's love. I, I am so spoiled. My husband and I are so spoiled. We are so blessed. But we'll never be worthy. But, but we must have God's help to get through this. And we must pray more often. We just get too carried away. Yeah, yeah absolutely. That's very good point. No, not at all. Not at all. all right, so who has John 14? John 14. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, keep my commandments. I, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. The spirit of truth, whom the word world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know it, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans when, when I come to you. So that idea, when Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments, that's not a command. The language there is descriptive. He's saying, if you love me, you will do this. Like, this is the natural byproduct of what somebody does when they love Jesus. So if the Bible and God tells us to pray unceasingly, and we all admit that we don't do it enough, Does that mean that we don't love Jesus? Oh, God. Um, no, it means we're not perfect. No, it means we're not perfect. And, and of course, I think we can all agree and acknowledge that it, it's not that exclusive, right? Like, it's, it's not to the point, like, it's, uh, you mentioned hyperbole, right? And, and it's that idea that we want to be praying continually to always be in a mode of prayer, but that doesn't mean that you can spend every moment of your day constantly in prayer. But our relationship with God should be such so that whenever we're, we're so close to him that in every moment it's almost like, even if we're not sitting there going, dear Father in heaven, you know, and running through like what we would consider a formal prayer, maybe it's a, a more of an informal as just sort of talking to God, being that close, just that intimate with our Lord and Savior that in every moment of our lives, every, every point, it feels like we're communing with him. It feels like we're talking to him. We're always sort of in tune with what he wants and trying to express that. And that's sort of the idea of what, of what he means with, if you love me, you will do these things. You'll be so close to me that you can't help but be just, it's just so natural to you that you don't even notice that you're doing it sometimes. So I'd like everyone to flip over to Judges chapter 6. See, we're going through this, and the, the last several weeks I've been kind of bouncing around an idea, like which, which part of prayer I wanted to cover, which one of those examples in the New Testament. And then Tom got up here a couple of weeks ago and covered like every single verse in the New Testament that talked about prayer, and I was like, 
oh, okay, I can't use that one. Well, maybe I'll use this. And he hit that point, and I'm like, okay, I can't use that one. I'll, I'll have to come up with something else. So we're going to go all the way back to Gideon. Now, an angel visits Gideon, and he has a conversation. So it's an angel of the Lord. He's talking to God directly. It's God's messenger. Now, you say, well, technically, that's not a prayer. But Gideon's speaking to God's representative. The only difference between that and the way we pray is that he's audibly hearing answers back directly in the moment. Now, I, I want to begin by sort of giving you a little bit of a background. So we're going to read Judges chapter 6, and we're going to begin with the first 10 verses just to sort of uh, set the backdrop of what's going on with Gideon if you're not familiar with this particular scene. Judges chapter 6 says, The Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight, so the Lord turned them over to Midian for seven years. The Midianites overwhelmed Israel because uh, because of Midian, the Israelites made shelters for themselves in the hills, caves, and strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites, the Amalekites, and the people from the east would attack them. They invaded the land and devoured its crops all the way to Gaza. They left nothing for the Israelites to eat, and they took away the sheep, the oxen, and the donkeys. When they invaded with their cattle and uh, tents, they were as thick as locusts. Neither they nor their camels could be counted. They came to devour the land. Israel was so severely weakened by Midian that the Israelites cried out to the Lord for help. When the Israelites cried out to the Lord for help because of Midian, the Lord sent a prophet to the Israelites. He said to them, This is what the Lord God of Israel has said. I brought you up from Egypt and took you out of that place of slavery. I rescued you from Egypt's power. And from the power of all who oppressed you, I drove them out before you and gave their land to you. I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship the gods of the Amorites, in whose land you are now living, but you have disobeyed me. Think about the initial message coming to the Israelites. They're at this point where they are just taken over. They're oppressed. They're being beaten up. All their resources are taken away from them. They're poor. They're out there, and they're working all summer long. And come harvest time, where I'm finally supposed to get the food back from all that work that I've been putting in all year. And here comes these guys over the top of the hill that just come in and just take out everything. So depressed. So oppressed <coughs> that they cry out to the Lord to help him. And the Lord's response is, it's your fault. You ever have a moment like that where, where you think that things are just so bad and you're crying out to the Lord and, and you're just thinking about that and you've been praying about it and you've been begging and pleading for something to happen and what comes back is, <laughs> you're the one that messed that up. Not a very comfortable idea to think about, is it? And some of you are like, ah, I don't know if I want to pray now. <laughs> right? Because I don't want to hear that it's my fault. I don't want to hear that I messed things up. But the reality is, we look at our own lives and our own situations, more often than not, that's kind of what we notice. Why were the Israelites so oppressed? What did they do? I heard it sinned. You just got her hand up. Oh, what? no, I was going to say, they, they disobeyed God and they were working hard every day, but everything was being taken from them because they had done what they weren't supposed to do. They disobeyed God. Russ, did you, I saw you. Uh, it seems obvious that they were worshiping other gods, especially the gods of the Amorites. He told them not to. And he told them not to. So, essentially, you have the Israelites who are in these conditions because they forgot who their true God was. They turned their back on him. And they were worshiping something that wasn't even real. You ever forget God? You ever turn your back on him? Yet you ever been, been so far into sin that you feel like, I, I just can't come back and I, I can't pray because I, I can't really talk to God after what I've been doing? See, sometimes I think that that's one of those blockers that keeps us away from God is because we've maybe had a weak point and maybe indulged in something sinful and we thought, gosh, I, I don't want to go in front of the almighty and holy God after, after what I just did. Kind of like that feeling of being unworthy that was mentioned earlier. That's the wonderful thing about repentance and forgiveness. <clears throat> is 
that God will continue to forgive us and do our best to walk the straight and narrow path and follow our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And we have to keep that in mind. I think about David, and then I think about Paul, and I say, Lord, I'm, if you can forgive them, I know you can forgive me. And we focus on the negative of the sin, and we can't forgive ourselves when God can forgive us if we ask him. It, it is kind of ironic that the time that we feel least worthy to talk to God might just be the time that we need him the most. And maybe when you find yourself in that situation and you're feeling that way, you need to just say, you know what? Forget it. I'm going to go do it anyways, even though I'm embarrassed, even though I'm ashamed, even though I know I'm not worthy to talk to God, even though I don't feel like this is the right time. Sometimes we just have to do it anyways. Hey. Uh, Psalm 51 says, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, Oh God, you will not despise. So it's at, at that point, when we get to that point, rather than feel like there's nothing we can do, it, it's at that point where God uh, sees our broken heart and he's ready to help. And, and maybe sometimes that uh, we haven't gotten to that point yet, and that's why we feel like we don't want to go in prayer to God. And we need to get ourselves there, is really... What, where you're going with that. It, is that, you know, if, you, if you've been off wandering somewhere and you're like, ah, this is bad, I don't really, but we don't really want to give that up either. Well, maybe, maybe sometimes something has to be broken in order for it to be fixed. Tyler? Uh, that term, um, the bondage from sin. That's not the term, it's close. What is this, the term, uh, the, the bondage of sin? Uh, as I get older, it makes I find more places where that makes sense, and this is just one of those where that sin has, in your mind, tied you down and separated you from God to the point where you are actually locked down to this, and it was your own actions. And, and just like you're saying, we're we're not really, but we we envision these chains, and we and we stop ourselves from from communicating with God. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. So let, let's keep reading about Gideon, verse 11. The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak tree in Ophrah, owned by Joash the Abazirite. He arrived while Joash's son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press so that he could hide it from the Midianites. Now, most of us in this room have probably never threshed wheat. Anyone? No? No? No. Okay. The way this works is... The chaff is really light and blows away in the wind, and the wheat is heavier. So you, you throw it up in the air, the breeze coming through blows away the chaff, and what falls back down to you is the food that you want to keep. So if you're doing this process, where would you want to do it? Out in the open. It's probably up on a hill somewhere at the top where you've got the most breeze blowing through, so it's going to take away the, the bad stuff, and it's going to leave me with just the food. Where is Gideon doing this? In a hidden place. Under the oak tree, but inside of what? Inside a wine press. Inside of a wine press. Anybody know what a wine press is? Basically a big hole you dig in the ground so that you can throw all the grapes down in there and you stomp them until it's, it's a whole big mess. Okay, and, and this was a process that they used. So this is actually down, down into the ground. Now, is this the place that you'd want to be threshing wheat? No. Where's the breeze? How are you going to separate it? This doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but why is Gideon threshing wheat down hidden in the wine press instead of being up on the top of a hill where you got the breeze? Out of sight. What's that? Out of sight. Out of sight, Russ? He was hiding. hiding. He was hiding. Why was he hiding? From the Midian. Because they're going to come and take it. Right? He's hiding from the Midianites. But why? Because he was afraid. Can, can anybody here relate to, to have, having something taken from them? Can, can any of us relate to being afraid of something, maybe something bad happening? Maybe, I don't know, you, you work, you work, you work, and you finally get a paycheck, and as soon as you get the paycheck, you're like, all right, I've got something, and then you open the mailbox. 
<laughs> and then it's nothing. And, you, and then you pull out, you're like, Bill, and Bill, and Bill, and Bill. Right? And you look at the taxes that are taken out of church. Yeah. Yeah. For, for the millennials in the room, you open your email and you see the bills coming in with this. But, but you, you, you ever have that, that feeling where you're like, I, I just got something and now, oh, it's all gone. It's like it just got taken from me. Like, oh, I got, so I got to go back to work again. Well, that's kind of how Gideon is feeling in this moment. So what sort of point of view do you take during these situations? Let's keep reading. Uh, where are we at? So, verse 12. The angel of the Lord appeared and said to him, The Lord is with you, courageous warrior. Gideon said to him, Pardon me, but if the Lord is with us, why has such disaster overtaken us? Where are all his miraculous deeds that our ancestors told us about? They said, Did the Lord not bring us up from Egypt? But now... The Lord has abandoned us and has handed us over to Midian. Then the Lord himself turned and said, You have the strength. Deliver Israel from the power of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? Gideon said to him, But Lord, how can I deliver Israel? Just look, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the youngest in my family. The Lord said to him, Ah, but I will be with you. You will strike down the whole Midianite army. Gideon said to him, if you are really pleased with me, then give me a sign as proof that it is really you speaking with me. So what exactly do you have going on there? He's testing God. He's testing God. He's saying, well, if it's really you, can you prove that, that, that this is really what I'm supposed to be doing. Anybody ever pray that way? Anybody ever have a moment where they're like, I don't really know if, if you're really going to do this. Consider the difference in perspective. How does Gideon view himself? What does he say? That, that he's not strong enough. So, so look at uh, mm-hmm. 15. verse 15. Thank you. Gideon said to him, but Lord, how can I deliver Israel? Just look. My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the youngest in my family. He's doing absolutely everything to minimize himself. How does Gideon view himself? Poorly. Poorly. Not unworthy? Poorly. This guy doesn't think very highly of himself, does he? I, I don't know if it's unworthy or he just won't accept the fact. And he's been chosen to do this, but he's afraid to do it. He's, he's making he's, excuses. He's afraid to do it. He's making excuses, Tom. But the bottom line is he doesn't trust the angel of the Lord. Oh, he doesn't trust the angel of the Lord. Judy? And I, that's what I was going to say. He keeps saying, if, 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 I mean, if God was speaking to any of us, I think we'd probably acknowledge that it was him. But he, he's, he doesn't, he, like he, you know, he doesn't want to do it. And, well, if, 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 if it's really you, in, in our prayer life, do we have timid, weak prayers? Do we wonder sometimes if God is really going to answer our prayer? Do we really sometimes wonder, is God even there listening? David, did you? You know, as I'm listening to all this, I'm thinking a verse from Revelation came to my mind. I just looked it up in Revelation 21 8. And it says, But for the cowardly, then it says unbelief. And then it gives other ones. I mean, the abominable, the murder, the doubt. But the point is, the cowardly are those Christians who remain in neutral because of the fear that keeps them from actually doing what they... I wonder how many of us ever really consider that verse uh, in Revelation where it speaks about the cowardly. You know, we know the end of this story, you know, with Gideon, but uh, how many of us, how many people going to the, going to the day of judgment thinking that they're in good shape because, you know, they, they follow the rules, but they allow a fear to keep them from really doing anything for the kingdom. But I showed up on Sunday. And so I just, it makes me wonder sometimes when we think of this, you know, these conversations, and we think of them at different levels. But, but 
but if they, if they were so cowardly and so fearful that they didn't say anything to anybody else, and we have the Great Commission that says go out into all the world and make disciples of men, did they really keep all the rules? And that's my point. It's, you know, if we're, if we're allowing fear because we're you know, afraid of what the reaction will be, afraid of what mom and dad might think, afraid of what, you know, losing a friend, or that, so we're not going to say anything, but we know that's the command. And I wonder how many of us ever consider the word cowardly. And anybody ever been afraid to, to share the gospel with someone because you feel like you just don't know enough Bible? Yeah, right? The rest of you who didn't raise your hands can be on the front row on Sunday, right? Because reality is we've all done that at some point, except for maybe Russ. The rest of us have at some point shirked back and been like, I don't really know if I'm going to know enough, if I'm going to be good enough to answer the questions, and, and what if they ask me something I don't know, and I, I uh, so we don't do it. How many of us consider ourselves, look at ourselves that way? How do we view ourselves? How did Gideon view himself? We, probably a lot of the way we can relate to him, right, Steve? Is it possible he felt overwhelmed with this situation? Oh, I'm sure Gideon felt overwhelmed. So maybe that created a lack of confidence, not necessarily cowardice, but a lack of confidence. Like, why has all this been happening, even though he maybe didn't ask the right question? Well, and, and, and that's fair, and, and we can lack confidence in the same way, right? I mean, that, that's, that's a great another way to look at it. Now, I want you to notice, though, how does God view Gideon? What does he call him? Warrior. Valiant warrior. He's worthy. Valiant warrior. Mine says courageous warrior. How many times do we look at ourselves the way we look at ourselves? And what if, instead, we looked at ourselves the way God looked at us? as the courageous warrior, as the soldier of the cross, as the mighty men, the valiant warrior, what, do you think that your prayer life would be any different if you looked at yourself that way? If you looked at yourself as, as, as empowered, as one who has the strength, as one who can conquer, as one who's in charge, one that can go out there and, and make something happen? If you looked at your own spiritual life that way, how would your prayer sound by comparison? God's not going to talk to us directly. And Gideon had that opportunity through the angel. Well, of course. And God speaks to us through his word today. That's the importance mm -hmm. of staying in the Bible and reading it until we understand it and we're able to live it. Absolutely. If and you hear... You gain confidence by that. If you hear God's voice talking to you directly today, go get help somewhere. Uh, Barb? Do you? In contrast with that, however, we are also to remain humble. And it's very difficult to find where I'm being humble, but being brave, but being courageous, but don't forget you're being humble. And it's a fine line between that sometimes. And, and, and that's actually really interesting because that, that's sort of where we're going to get. Because what gives us the confidence versus uh, how we look at ourselves. And that's something you think about <laughs> Paul, right? Paul was humble, and yet he was confident. Why? Because he understood who the Lord was. He understood that the Lord's work. And even though, yes, they, you know, they received the visions, and they had the Holy Spirit you know, working through them. Well, we have the Holy Spirit in us. And we have the word, of, uh, the word that guides us now. But the difference is, why is it, though, many of us still don't have confidence? You can still be humble, but have that so there's several you know, Bible studies that can really spawn on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I mean, and do we have confidence when we pray? Do we have confidence that God's going to answer us? God put away. Do we have confidence that God would actually do what we ask? Butchie? I have, in listening to this and hearing this, you know, there are times when you go and you pray to God and, the, and you ask for certain things or you ask him to deal for certain things. And instead of me saying, oh, I want you to do this, I need for you to do this, you know, this is what my problem is, this is what, you know, what's going on. But I always end it with your will be done because he may not give me what I'm asking for. It may not come in that time. It may not ever come. So my thing is that 
I have to live with what I have, you know, and if he didn't answer the way I wanted, it was because, you know, I think you can do it by yourself or something. Well, and, and it's interesting because sometimes I wonder if we don't pray and we don't ask for certain things because we lack the faith that God would actually do it. Now, I want you to notice something. So we were talking about his lack of confidence, talking about him testing God, trying to put conditions on God, which sounds ridiculous on its face. But uh, uh, flip over towards the end of the chapter, uh, beginning in verse 36. Gideon said to God, if you really intend to use me to deliver Israel as you promised, then give me a sign as proof. Look, I am putting a wool fleece on the threshing floor. If there is dew on the fleece and the ground is dry, then... I will be sure that you will use me to deliver Israel as you promised. Notice what verse 38 says. The Lord did as he asked. See, sometimes I think when we pray, I don't know that we necessarily always believe that God's going to do what we ask. A lot of times we go, well, I know that sometimes he tells me no, sometimes he doesn't do that. And we sort of use that as this crutch to pray weak prayers, to not believe that God's actually going to answer us. Think about, think about the way that we even pray sometimes. Somebody's in the hospital with cancer. Are we praying to God, the great physician, that he's going to reach and he's going to heal that illness? Or do we just say, well, just be with the doctor so they can, they can take care of him? Do we really believe that God can and would heal him? Just a question. And, and it's interesting because you, you see this happen he tests God, and not only does God come through after he gives him all these conditions, but when he gets up the next morning, you know, he, it's fleece is soaking wet, right? And then, verse 39, Gideon says to God, please do not get angry with me when I ask just for one more sign. Please allow me one more test with the fleece. This time, make the fleece dry while the ground around it is covered with dew. That night, God did as he asked. Only the fleece was dry and the ground around it was covered with dew. I mean, you're like, can you imagine this guy? Like, he has got, this is the third time he's asked God to prove that it was him. And all three times, God comes through. And yet, Gideon's like, ah, I still don't know. Now, of course, we know what happens, right? He takes Gideon out there. They go beat up all the, the Midianites. They chase him out of the land because the, the people are, are finally faithful. God actually provides. God does the work. Gideon doesn't actually have to do it. And I think there, therein lies the key that, that answers your question, Barb, is how do we stay humble ourselves because, but yet pray boldly because we recognize that it's the power that we're tapping into that, we're, that causes the boldness, and it's not our power. That's the difference. Now, someone's going to ring that bell because I'm not back there to hit it. <laughs> I flip over really quick to Habakkuk chapter 3. Habakkuk prays a prayer to God at the end of chapter 3. It's almost a song in essence. And I want to cover that really quick in the last five minutes. Because I want you to see the difference where Gideon's looking at I, me, my action. I want you to notice how this prayer that Habakkuk prays sounds different than the perspective that Gideon had. Habakkuk chapter 3. Some of you are still checking the index to figure out where that one's hitting at. I'll just read it to you because time's short. Habakkuk chapter 3. This is the prayer of Habakkuk the prophet. The prophet. Lord, I have heard the report of what you did. I am awed, Lord, by what you accomplished. In our time, repeat those deeds. In our time, reveal them again. <clears throat> but when you cause turmoil, remember to show us mercy. God comes from Taman, the Holy One from Mount Paran. His splendor covers the skies. The earth is full of his glory. His brightness will be as lightning a two-pronged lightning bolt that flashes from his hand. This is the outward display of his power. Plague will go before him. Pestilence will march right behind him. 
he took his battle position and shook the earth. With a mere look, he frightened the nations. The ancient mountains disintegrated. The primeval hills were flattened. His are ancient roads. roads. I saw the tents of Cushan, overwhelmed by trouble. The tent curtains of the land of Midian were shaking. Was the Lord mad at the rivers? Were you angry with the rivers? Were you enraged at the sea? Such that you would climb into your horse-drawn chariots, your victorious chariots, you bow, uh, your bow is ready for action. You commission your arrows. You cause flash floods on the earth's surface. When the mountains see you, they shake. The torrential downpour sweeps through. The great deep shouts out. It lifts up its hands on high. The sun, the moon stand still in their courses. The flash of your arrows drives them away. The bright light of your lightning is quick, your lightning quick spear. You furiously stomp on the earth. You angrily trample down the nations. You march out to deliver your people, to deliver your special servant. You strike the leader of the wicked nation, laying him open from the lower body to the neck. You pierce the, he the heads of the warriors with a spear. They storm forward to scatter us. They shout with joy as if they were plundering the poor with no opposition. But you trample on the sea with your horses on the struggling, surging, raging waters. I listened and my stomach churned. The sound of it made my lips quiver. My frame went limp as if my bones were decaying, and I shook as I tried to walk. I longed for the day of distress to come upon the people who attack us. When the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines, when the olive trees do not produce, and the fields yield no crops, when the sheep disappear from the pen, and there are no cattle in the stalls, I will rejoice because of the Lord. I will be happy because of the God who delivers me. The sovereign Lord is my source of strength. He gives me the agility of a deer. He enables me to negotiate the rugged terrain. Did you notice what sounded so different between Gideon and Habakkuk? I hear random whispers. What is it? What's the difference? The focus is on God. Everything is you. Your, your mighty power, every piece of it is looking at God and what he did and his power to accomplish something. If we realized that we shouldn't be linked with men, that we should be linked with God because we are Christians, should we not have that same level of boldness when we're able to stand up and pray? Because we have access to a power that is so overwhelming to everything on this world that nothing can stop us. And how dare we shirk back and be afraid to pray, be afraid to speak up to God, be afraid to tap into this power. He's given this power. He's given us access to it. Why wouldn't we use it? And yet every person, myself included, at the beginning of this class raised our hand and said, we don't pray enough. Maybe knowing that power and the access that we have, we should pray unceasingly. Let's go to God in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we are just so overwhelmed and awed by your power. We, we are just so fortunate and so lucky that, that we can tap into the great and mighty power, Lord, that we have access to you. Not just to wield your power like you're some sort of tool, but to have that true relationship where every nature of our being is aligned with you. And Lord, we ask that every one of us here will spend more time in prayer to get closer to you, to grow that relationship. Lord, help us to realize the true magnitude of what you can do. Amen. Lord, we ask that you will come into our lives, overwhelm our spirits, take over us, and cause us to act fearlessly in defense of your kingdom. Help us to go out into the world. Help us to talk to people. Lord, we ask that you will let your light shine through us. And Lord, we ask that you indeed do keep us humble. Help that knowledge that it is not our power that we wield, but yours. Keep us truly humble as we walk, as we go throughout our days. Lord, we ask that you will just help us all to pray more, to remember, to think of you, to be so one in communion with you that it is indeed as if we pray unceasingly. Yes. Lord, we ask you to watch over us as we depart. And we ask that throughout this time that you give us on this earth, that you may continue to lead us new souls so that we may, 
we may show them your mercy and your grace so that you may save them and add them to your kingdom. Lord, we ask this now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.